And now, if you would please join me in welcoming Tom and Lindsay Bell, University of Florida, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, Advanced Florida Master Naturals. I just want to say not only are Tom and Lindsay Bell amazing naturalists, wildlife photographers, top-notch birders, really cool people, among other things, but they have the gift of being able to share their adventures in a way that makes it seem we are right there with them. So tonight, we're going north, way north to Churchill, Manitoba with Tom and Lindsay on a wildlife adventure extraordinaire. So sit back and enjoy your guided Tom. Lindsay, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'll turn it over to you now. You're welcome. Tom and I traveled actually our third trip to Churchill this past November to see the polar bears. Tonight, we want to share with you a bit about the Churchill area, why the bears like it, and a lot of just good, really neat stuff about polar bears, but also about the multiple types of foxes that we saw and observed, as well as the birds that amazingly can spend the winter in Churchill. Hudson Bay is bordered by four Canadian provinces. Um, and sits on the far western border in the northern part of Manitoba. There are no roads leading to Churchill. If you want to go there, you either take the train or fly. Or if you are really, really ambitious, it's a 625-mile paddle from Winnipeg. The bay itself is two times or so the size of Texas. And Churchill and the area surrounding it is a world famous spot for wildlife observation throughout the year. Within just 10 miles of the community, there are three separate ecosystems from the marine summer home to beluga whales, to the boreal forest where one can find moose and red fox, to the open tundra. This photo was actually taken in July, a number of years back when we were out on the tundra. We didn't see much that was green when we were there in November. As we flew in, in fact, the tundra and the area surrounding Churchill looked quite a bit different than it had in July several years previously. Ecotourism is the true driving force of Churchill's economy. There's something going on throughout the year, and they estimate that some half million tourists visit the community, generating significant money for the Churchill community. Ah, Miss Piggy, this cargo plane made a crash landing a number of years back, oh, probably four or five miles from the airport. It has become a local landmark and it is known as Miss Piggy because the owner of the cargo company had a very bad habit of overloading his flights. As Lindsay said, this was our third trip to Churchill. Our first one was some 20 years ago or so in February to see the Northern Lights. We left Tampa, it was, temperature was in the 80s. We landed in Churchill, the wind chill was minus 55 degrees, and the actual temperature never got above minus 25 degrees the entire week we were there. But oh, were those northern lights beautiful. Our second trip was in the summer of 2019 to see the beluga whales, which congregate in the mouth of the Churchill River by the thousands in the summer. The picture in the bottom right is what Churchill looks like at that time. That, that's the street down the center of town, no traffic lights. We actually got to see beautiful, beautiful shots of the whales under the water with our with GoPro cameras. They're very curious, they're very vocal. They come over to you, they just basically talk to you if you will. It was just so much fun to watch them underwater do their thing. 
And then when we got up on the surface, up close and personal with them, you could they would you could paddle slow, slowly backwards and they would just follow you, chirping at you, talking to you. The darker ones in the background are the youngsters. They they're all white when they become adults. And our latest trip just a couple months ago in November, Churchill looked a little bit different. That street that was so nice and clean and warm in July looked a little bit different this time. We really wanted to see the Arctic fox in its white winter coat. They're the only dimorphic canine with two color phases. We have seen them several times in their brown summer coat in the bottom left uh, picture, but we really wanted to see one in the white coat of the Arctic winter. They're about the size of a large cat, maybe eight, nine, 10 pounds or so. They have several Arctic adaptations. They have a short muzzle, short legs and short ears, which decrease their heat loss. They have very densely furred foot pads, which give them better traction on the snow. And in the Arctic winter, which is dark 24 hours a day, a keen hearing sense and an exceptional sense of smell are much more important when they're hunting than is their eyesight. A family of Arctic foxes is made up of a male, interestingly enough, called a dog, and two vixens. One is a non-breeding female from the previous year's litter that sort of helps out, and the other one is the breeding female, which mates with the dog and produces their five to eight kits a year. They are monogamous with about a two-month gestation period, and their population, the Arctic fox population, depends on the lemming population. In winter, they do not hibernate. They're very nomadic, often following the polar bears, eating the scraps left behind when the polar bears finish eating. Their dens are elaborately constructed with numerous entrances and long tunnel systems. Some of them have been used for centuries. So you can imagine how many successive <laughs> generations of foxes have used some of these dens and the beautiful, beautiful, handsome red foxes. Very shy and elusive, but most of you have probably seen one in your travels around wherever you've been. Their colors are variable, but all red foxes have black socks, white cheek patches that you can see on this one, and a white tip on their bushy tail. Due to global warming, their range is expanding north into the Arctic fox territory. And when these two species get together, the red fox is the dominant of the two. It was fun just to watch the foxes be foxes, um, just see watching them do their thing. We weren't bothering this one in any way and they paid us no attention, no attention at all, just watching a fox do his thing. They tend to have about four kits and their pups are weaned on mom's milk and semi-digested meat that's regurgitated by both parents. They become accustomed to humans easily. They're wide range, very, very wide range. They're in almost every state and almost every continent. You can see a little difference between the footprints of the fox on the left and the polar bear on the right. We were very, very lucky to see the silver fox. This is a melanistic form of the red fox. Very opportunistic feeders, but their diet is almost totally carnivorous. We watched this one hunting out in the snow, and you notice that even though it's the melanistic form, it still has that white tip on that bushy tail. Seasonally monogamous, both parents take care of the kids and the males feed the vixens and the pups and protect the den. The one we were really lucky to see is the cross fox. This is what happens when a red fox and a silver fox get together and it's, this forms a partially melanistic form of the red fox. Very, very, very handsome. When we photographers were outside, 
the bear guards and the guides had previously told us, and in no uncertain terms, I might add, that if a bear was getting too close and they told us to get into our vehicles, that that didn't mean take a few more pictures. It meant put your cameras away and get yourself into the vehicles to be safe. This bear ambled slowly toward us, not aggressively, but we may have just been in his way, but close enough that we were told to get into our vehicles. We headed back to our van, but the side door was locked. So all six of us were standing around trying to get the sliding door unlocked and the bear got closer. Finally, one of us jumped into the passenger seat, climbed over it and unlocked the door from the inside. All turned out well as the bear strolled by a few yards away, paying us no mind at all. These next several photographs were taken uh, on our summer trip to Churchill. We were just totally fortunate to find this mom and two cubs. As I said earlier, we didn't see much of anything green other than the fir trees when we were there in November. The western shore of Hudson Bay is the best place to see polar bears in the wild. During the winter when the bay is frozen, they are out on the ice hunting seals and they stay out on the ice as long as possible to continue the hunt. As the ice begins to break up, they tend to ride the flows southward and then come ashore. During the summer months, they're spread out along the western coast and begin slowly moving northward. By mid-October, there are some 600 to 1,000 bears massed along the 100-mile stretch of coast from Churchill and the Churchill River down to the Nelson River, the largest concentration of polar bears in the world. So what draws them to this spot? Freshwater freezes before saltwater by four or five degrees. And with this big inflow from both the Churchill and Nelson rivers into the saltwater Hudson Bay, um, this area tends to freeze first. These bears can't wait to get back out on the ice um, as most of them haven't eaten in some seven to eight months. Ursus maritimus a true marine bear, uh, in all reality, a marine mammal. On the evolutionary tree, they diverged from the brown bears about a half million years ago and big, big animals. Females often will weigh over 600 pounds, the males almost twice that amount. They have large brains. In fact, bears have the largest brains relative to body size of all land mammals. They have huge, heavily muscled necks and tapered heads and snouts. Um, this is a good design for going into seal breathing holes after their prey. And this thick neck is so marked in the adult males that they can't be fitted with GPS collars. They simply slide right off over their head. Massive, massive forepaws, the size of a full-size dinner plate and a bit bigger than the hind paws. Their toes have some webbing, which is a help when they're swimming. And just like the foxes Tom spoke about, they have fur pads that Aim, uh, aid with traction when walking in the snow and ice. There is a significant amount of work being carried out now, and it looks as if they're going to be able to individually identify these bears by their footprints. Very keen sense of smell. They can detect a seal as much as 20 miles away or one that is under three feet of snow. Their coat is very, very well adapted to the Arctic environment. They have a very dense under fur, analogous to a heavy set of long johns that we might wear. And then they have hollow guard hairs that are very effective at reflecting heat back to the black skin. And on that lower bear, you can appreciate the black skin around the neck and on the back leg. 
this system is actually so efficient that sometimes they will have problems with overheating. Uh, it wasn't unusual at all for us to see a bear totally splayed out in the snow to keep cool. And their tongue almost appears blue. It is so well vascularized. And this is a big, big help to them uh, through panting to help them lose heat. Very curious animals. These two are utilizing uh, highway markers and supports for scratching. And they're even interested in photography. Um, we were watching this bear amble down the beach and uh, another group of photographers separate from ours was also out watching him and probably pushed the envelope a little too far before hopping back in their vehicle. One of the photographers left his camera, his little GoPro on the beach and the bear dispatched that without any difficulty. They are essentially totally carnivorous. Their prime prey are the ring seals that they hunt out on the sea ice. However, they will also dig for roots and tubers. A couple of a uh, bit graphic shots coming up, not too bad though. These ring seals that are their prime prey are thankfully uh, not in any way, shape or form threatened, which is a good thing because during an average winter season, they will hunt and kill up to 10% of the adults and fully one half of the seal pups but they'll go after any high fat meal, a narwhal in the upper left, a beluga whale in the lower right, and that fella on the upper right uh, scavenging a whale carcass, which most likely was a bowhead. I hope most of you had an opportunity to see the Seven Worlds, One Planet BBC program a few years back. Their crews were in the area just north of Churchill filming belugas and documented a really uh, unique and I believe previously before unknown um, hunting technique. Uh, the bears typically don't eat during the summer months. They basically try and use as little energy as possible. But this bear had moseyed out in the river, swum out in the river, and was standing on a rock watching the belugas get closer and closer. And he found the perfect opportunity for a summer meal. Uh, got close enough, he dove in the water and came up with a huge midsummer meal. Just an amazing sight for these photographers to document. They have huge stomachs. They can eat as much as 150 pounds at one time. And to maintain their weight and health, they need to take a seal every five or six days. Only the pregnant females den, and it's not a true hibernation, more a state of dormancies. Non-pregnant females and males do not den they actually spend the summer and early fall months in what is often referred to as a state of walking hibernation. They will lose a significant amount of weight during these summer months. Their energy is supplied by their stored fat and the chemical reaction to break down the fat so that they may utilize as an energy source generates metabolic water, which satisfies their uh, needs for fresh water so they don't have to seek out a source of fresh water or eat snow. We humans ovulate spontaneously. Bears and many other mammals such as lions have what is referred to as induced ovulation. Ovulation is induced by multiple mating episodes uh, between the bonded couple. The females become sexually mature at five to six years of age, the males several years later. They breed out on the pack ice from March until June, 
And when a female enters estrus, the males are able to follow her scents through her urine as well as in her footprints. When a pair gets together, they will stay together about two weeks. And this is essentially the only time the males and females get together. But even within this pair, each of them can mate with others. And it has certainly been documented that in twin pregnancies, there can be different fathers. The fights for mating rights out on the ice are notoriously very vicious and fierce, um, sometimes resulting in quite significant injuries and occasionally even death. Uh, the males sort of tune up for this time by play fighting. Uh, while they're sitting there hanging out, waiting for the bay to freeze, they will have little sparring matches. We watch these two guys go at it probably for two or three hours, just standing up and duking it out and then taking a rest by lying down in the snow for a bit before getting up and going after each other again. But very important to tune up for the real time out on the ice. The reproductive strategy employed by bears is known as delayed implantation. We mentioned the breeding out on the ice in the late winter and early spring. Uh, the fertilized embryo will go through a number of divisions and then further division is halted in the blastocyst stage. If implantation occurs, it does not occur until September. Then the mom will enter a birthing den October, November or so, and some two months later will give birth to a tiny cub weighing little more than a pound. Mom and cub or cubs will emerge from the den in late March, early April, and the cubs by this point weigh 25 pounds, give or take. This emergence is associated to a time when the ring seals are pupping so that they have an abundant food supply. Delayed implantation is very effective for these animals because it prevents birth at the onset of winter's harshest conditions. And implantation will only occur if mom's health is very good. She will have need to have increased her body weight almost by half if a pregnancy is going to proceed. Otherwise, the blastocyst will be aborted. We've mentioned how the stored fat releases fatty acids for energy sources for the adults, but a fetus cannot use these fatty acids. They are unable to cross the placental barrier. The fetus depends instead on breakdown of mom's protein as a food source while in utero. If this went on for a very lengthy time, this would be quite detrimental to her health. So the gestation is shortened to two months and these preemie cubs are born. They, however, can utilize the fatty acids because they compose about 40% of mom's milk. This little exhibit in the local Churchill Museum uh, shows the relative size of these bears from two weeks up to three months. And of all mammals, bears give birth to the smallest young in comparison to mom's weight, a mere two to three tenths of a percent. Human, or blue whales notch this up to 2%, humans six, and bats an amazing 30%. The Western Hudson Bay population of polar bears dig their dens in peat. You don't have the heavy snow and ice that's found in other polar bear areas. And sometimes these dens are as much as 60 miles inland. In 1969, one of the largest denning areas was discovered just a little over 30 miles south of Churchill. It today is Wap Wapusk National Park. The nursing bears uh, will continue this for some two and a half years. 
uh, the frequency of nursing, as well as the fat content of mom's milk decrease over this interval. And the cubs are able to eat seal meat as soon as they emerge from the den. And again, the growth of these cubs is just phenomenal. By eight months, they're over 100 pounds. And they will tend to stay with mom for upwards of three years, learning how to hunt and learning how to be a polar bear. This mom and her year old cub, uh, we saw them the first time we were out and they walked just right, right in front of the van. It was truly an amazing experience. Churchill is the most bear aware community in the world. When we were there in the summer and out on hikes, there was always a bear guard present. And in the community of Churchill, it is actually illegal to lock your car. And most businesses, restaurants, hotels, et cetera, leave their doors unlocked so that if a bear does come into town, you can quickly get out of harm's way. When we were in Churchill in the summer, this bear on the two right photos actually came into town. These photos were taken by our bus driver. We didn't, we weren't lucky enough to see this bear in town. But if a bear does come into town, the police and the wildlife officers will get on the bear as closely as they can, blowing horns, firing off blank shotgun shells or cracker shells. If these measures don't motivate the bear to leave town, a helicopter goes up and gets as close as possible to the bear, again trying to push him out of town. If these measures all fail, the bear is darted and taken to the local bear jail, uh, more properly known as the holding facility. If the bay is frozen, they are only held for a couple of days and then helicoptered out onto the ice. If the bay is not frozen, they're kept for 30 days and then flown some 50 kilometers outside of town. While in the holding facility, they're only given water, especially those that are in there for 30 days. Uh, they're not eating typically then anyway, so this is no great hardship and they don't want the bears to get used to this as a free food source. And this is not at any inexpensive proposition for the Canadian government. Climate change is the single number one threat to the world's polar bears. In the Hudson Bay area, uh, the sea ice is disappearing as much as three weeks sooner and forming later. This reduces the number of days that the bears have available to do hunting for seals. And in some areas, they've actually documented that the bears are decimating Arctic nesting bird colonies, sometimes taking 90% of the eggs and chicks. In this Churchill population, there's been a decrease by 15% in the average weight of the bears over the last 40 years and a decrease in 30% of the total number of bears found here over the last 30 years. Triplet pregnancies used to be not an uncommon occurrence with this Western Hudson Bay population, but it is rarely if ever seen today. There are only a handful of birds that are tough enough to overwinter in the Arctic. The list on the left is the group of birds that we saw on this trip and the snowy owls at the top of the list for a reason. It's what Lindsay and I call an end of the rainbow bird as we'd never seen one before, which is actually kind of amazing with all the time we've spent in the Arctic over the years. It would be a life bird for us. So picture us on the last morning of the trip. We're already a little sad because we hadn't seen any bears yet that morning, and it wouldn't be too much longer before we'd be flying in a snowstorm the 625 miles from Churchill back to Winnipeg. We're in our four-wheel drive vehicle, moving slowly along the shoreline of Hudson Bay, when we had what's called a Gene Murphy pow moment, and this beautiful female snowy owl 
rose in front of us. They're a mix of a powerfully efficient predator and graceful beauty. They're the largest of the Arctic birds and the heaviest of the North American owls weighing upwards of three pounds. And with a, almost a six foot wingspan and that weight, they're one of the largest and heaviest owls in the world. They are sexually dimorphic, the females being larger and heavier than the males. The males are almost always white and the females are almost always heavily barred like this female. Their feathers envelop both their feet and their legs, which obviously help keep them warm, especially in the Arctic winter. Their diet is almost totally carnivorous and lemmings are the number one prey item. In the nesting season, a pair may eat upwards of 2,000 lemmings a year. They'll also take other birds. They'll also take fish in slow moving uh, shallow streams. And they'll often take Arctic hares, which outweigh the owls by four times. And like the Arctic foxes, the owl population depends on the lemming population, which tends to run in four year cycles. When the lemmings are having a down year, many of the owls will not even bother to nest that year. <laughs> that picture and the, the upper picture is the first one we saw of the owl and we thought, are you kidding me? We're not even gonna count this. It was so far away in the middle of a snowstorm. They are eruptive migrants and the numbers vary dramatically from year to year. In winter, they'll eat almost anything. And if the winds blow them south into the US, they're typically not coming for food. A lot of times they're young birds that are nomadic. And if they have transmitters like that bird in the bottom right that log precise GPS locations every few minutes, it's interestingly shown that they are cruising farmlands in Michigan and Ontario after rodents, or they spend upwards of two to three weeks in the open leads on the frozen Great Lakes hunting ducks. Or what was most amazing to us, they hunt waterfowl over the open Atlantic. Both sexes, both the males and the female, have these low, powerful, raspy hoots that can carry for several miles over the tundra. They lay five to eight eggs every other day, so it's not unusual that the young hatch every other day. Um, Fortunately, younger ones often die being trampled or starved to death by their older and larger siblings. But nothing goes to waste. The dead owlets are eaten by mom or fed to the older chicks. The eyes of all owls are enormous in proportion to the size of the head and are fixed in those huge sockets. They can't look up, down, right, or left by moving their eyes. They have to move head. We humans can swivel ours a measly 180 degrees, but the owls compensate for their fixed eyes with the aid of 14 neck vertebrae, twice as many as we have, and that allows them to turn three quarters of the way around, 270 degrees. Not all owls have symmetrical ear openings like snowy owls and barn owls. In fact, great horned, barred, and burrowing owls have symmetrical ear openings. The snowy owls are diurnal hunters, but in the Arctic winter, when it's dark for 24 hours a day, their ears are much more important than their eyes for hunting. The owl's ears are on the sides of the head under the feathers of the facial discs, which act like inverted satellite dishes or parabolic microphones, which funnel and compact the sounds into the ear on that side of the head. The left ear opening is higher. So if the owl is hunting a few feet above the ground and hears a lemming scurrying under the eye and the snow below, the sound will get to that right ear just a fraction sooner than it gets to the left ear. And this is instantaneously calculated in the brain of the owl and that helps him determine the exact location of the lemming. The eiders that we saw were the Hudson Bay subspecies, the largest duck in North America, female on the bottom left, 
Mail in the fog on the bottom right. They tend to eat mussels and other shellfish as the main part of their diet. And the moms will pluck down feathers from their breast during the breeding season and the nesting season. They line the nest with the, these feathers, which make it soft for the eggs and the chicks. And these birds spend the winter in areas open, of open water surrounded by sea ice, which are called pollinias. Ah, the raven, one of the top five favorite birds on my list. They're by far the most widespread corvid and thought to be one of the smartest, if not the smartest bird of all birds. They're very, very acrobatic flyers. Every maneuver a stunt pilot can make in a plane can be duplicated by a raven in the air. They roll, turn, twist. One's been even documented to fly upside down for over a half a mile. Very, very fun to watch them swirl around in the winds. Really, really just fun to watch. They're very feisty, uh, quite cheeky, if you will. The one in the upper left is chasing a red-tailed hawk. The two in the upper right are having a territorial dispute. The one in the bottom left is trying to figure out what's in that PVC pipe. And the one on the bottom right is learning how to ride a bicycle. Many of you know that a group of crows is called a murder. A group of owls is called a parliament. A group of sap suckers is called a slurp. But you might not know that a group of ravens is called an unkindness. Every sound your stomach makes when you're hungry can be duplicated by a raven's call, bonks, croaks, you name it. But this call is a female raven and almost always a female raven in their normal call in the background. Every sound the rumblings from other parts of your GI tract make can also be repeated with the raven's calls, gargles, burps, you name it. But this call is a raven until proven otherwise. This raven, they're very opportunistic feeders. This one's trying to figure out if there's any scraps left behind by this polar bear after he'd been digging in the snow. They're very at home in the ice and the snow in the Arctic winter. Oftentimes they'll get on top of a, a small hill, slide down on the snow, and then fly back up to the top of the hill and do it over again. There are many videos of ravens in the town of Churchill. They'll get on the roof of the car, slide down the icy windshield onto the hood, and then fly back up to the roof and do it again, sometimes over and over and over again for an hour at a time or so. The state bird of Alaska, this is an adult male willow ptarmigan and his breeding plumage with that red comb over his eye. These birds keep a black tip square tail year round. In the winter, this is what the non-breeding adults look like. They have thick feathers that cover their legs for added warmth. They have feathers over their nostrils, which keep the snow out. They have feathers on their feet, which act as snowshoes, giving them traction in the snow. And they have sharp, elongated claws that act like crampons, which help them maneuver on the slippery ice. They're the largest of the three ptarmigan species and the most migratory upland game bird in North America. Their plumage correspond or changes during the year. They're all white in the winter and brown in the summer, and they tend to gravitate to areas that match their plumage color. Most of these birds, and you can see their, their legs are covered with feathers and their feet, but these birds will tend to stay on the white snow rather than go up in the brush where it's darker. In the winter, their diet consists of twigs and buds. In the summer, it switches to berries and seeds. And the nestlings that can fly at one week of age, which is really early, tend to eat soft and eat most easier to digest foods like spiders and caterpillars.
snow is used for insulation and as a hiding place from predators. They prefer to sleep under the snow. They'll oftentimes fly directly into a snow bank that keeps the predators like the Arctic foxes from following their tracks. Just so much fun to watch. They have an interesting clacking, gurgling sound in the mating season, as well as an elaborate display in the air. We didn't see that, unfortunately, but it's not nesting season. In the winter, the common red poles will add up to 30% more plumage to help keep them warm and they'll eat over 40% of their body mass every day. One of the most abundant breeding songbirds in North America, the Lapland longspur. They're called longspurs only in North America. The rest of the world calls them buntings. They have an elongated claw on their hind toe, which gives them their name. And in the summer, they'll eat between three and 10,000 seeds and insects every day. In the winter, they gather in huge flocks, which may number four million birds in a flock. The most abundant songbird in the high latitudes, the snow buntings are Arctic specialists. When they nest in rock crevices that stay cold all the time, the female will stay on the nest during incubation and the male brings her food. The, the plumage changes from the brown in the summer uh, to the dark, I mean, to the white in the winter. The males do not change by growing a new set of feathers. They change from brown to white by rubbing their belly and head in the snow. This wears down their brown feather tips, leading to that immaculate white feathers below, like those in the bottom left on that male. And oh, we were so fortunate to see that this jeer falcon, the males are about the size of a peregrine falcon, the females about the size of a red-tailed hawk. They have two color variations, the white and the brown. They, during the breeding season, the family needs two to three pounds of food every day, which translates into several ptarmigans or other bird species. They tend to nest on the top of guano piles, which may be as high as two meters. One of them was the lower level was radiocarbon dated and found to be 2,500 years old. You can only imagine how many successive generations of falcons have used that nest site. So we've talked about Churchill, a special area that wears many different hats during the seasons of the year. The amazing beluga whales, which spend the summer months in the Churchill River, having their babies and molting their skin. The amazing polar bears, which congregate in the largest concentration in the world. The gorgeous auroras, where for 300 days of the year, the opportunity to witness their beauty dancing in the heavens, and a little bit about the handful of birds tough enough to overwinter in the Arctic. Those who stand to be most impacted by the climate crisis have done the least to cause it. We need to help cure as much as possible the climate change crisis. So we thank you for tuning in and we'll try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Tom and Lindsay. What a fantastic presentation, amazing photos and what an amazing experience you both had, um, being able to see all those bears and foxes, the snowy owl, my gosh. Yeah, we don't, we don't have a lot of questions. Um, I had one about the, the snowy owl. Um, you had mentioned that it sometimes takes or it, it can take uh, animals that are four times its weight. And, and so I was curious on if there is a certain way that they deal with that, if they take an animal that big, is there a certain behavior? I mean, do they, do they uh, gobble it up on the ground and carry away the rest or just wondering about that? 
it depends on the time of the year. They'll take it back to the nest and feed parts of it to the chicks if they have any. If not, a lot of times they're hunting, there's not a lot of other things around. So they'll just eat the, the rabbit, the hare, where they kill it. So flying with an animal that's that much more heavy than them isn't, isn't a problem, huh? No, it's not a problem, but a lot of times they'll eat them where they kill them. Yeah. But yes, they, they're very, very strong and they can carry that not without any problem. That's just amazing. We have quite a few people that have come on to say, uh, oh, there is a question asking about if indigenous people can hunt. I'm assuming the polar bears um, is the question. Or if you're aware of what the indigenous reg regs are up there. In Canada, I'm not sure. I know in Greenland, from personal experience, that the indigenous peoples can hunt limited numbers of polar bears, but I'm not sure in Canada. I would imagine that they can take a certain number, but I, I don't know that for sure. And in Greenland, the end number changed every year. Uh, I don't know what they based it on. I guess the total number of bears that were in their survey, but it did change, but some of the, the small indigenous communities we went in, there'd be a polar bear skin hanging on out to dry and sort of tough to see, but we certainly understand why they do it. Is there anything that the local folks are doing with regard to climate change that it can have an impact? Natural Habitat and World Wildlife Fund are trying their best to help uh, the Churchill community since it's such a vital part um, year round. I mean, there's not a season where there aren't people there, uh, ecotourism, tourists coming in. So yeah, they're working on things. I can't give you any specific specifics, but we've talked to several of the guides in the Natural Habitat group as, and they are teamed with World Wildlife Fund. So yes, they're working on it, but I don't know what is being done specifically. A lot of people are just fascinated and amazed with your presentation and this experience tonight. Um, another fabulous presentation. Thank you, Bells. Thank you, Bells. What a fabulous presentation from the Rothsteins, uh, just goes on and on. Thoroughly interesting talk, wonderful information. We just love you and the, the, your uh, amazing photography and the biology and facts that you share with us it all wound up into information about such a fascinating place. Is, uh, John, a lot of those uh, those photographs that had the Rothstein's name on the bottom were taken by Lori and Rich Rothstein and Anchorage that live in Anchorage, and they're the best wildlife photographers we know. And they they uh, they helped a lot with the photographs in this talk. Well, we fantastic! Love them too. <laughs> fantastic, Dave. Uh, always learning something new from your talks. Thank you. Just goes on and on. We are so fortunate to have you guys. Um, tonight. And I really appreciate all the time and work that you put into putting this together and, and uh, curating this special presentation for us tonight for our members annual membership meeting. It really means a lot. You're most welcome. And if there aren't any other questions or comments, I'm going to go ahead and move to a close tonight. And uh, but before I do that, I want to thank everybody that came and visited us tonight. And again, thank you, Tom and Lindsay Bell, for a first-class presentation. Really appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Joan. Good night. Thanks, Joan.